Hi, I'm Steve Goodman and on Practical 365 today I wanted to talk to you about exchange vulnerabilities that are in the wild, in particular the new proxy token one. So first and foremost, if you've patched on the day or soon after when the July security updates were released for exchange 2013, 2016 and 2019, then you should be in a good position. But if you've only recently patched, then you should still be concerned because these vulnerabilities have been disclosed only this week. However, it does seem to be that people have found what these are and started to exploit them maybe a couple of weeks ago. So the earliest reports I've seen are maybe August the 10th. So this perhaps is something that has been known for a little bit longer than we thought. But from all accounts, after Microsoft released the patches, a good week after by, by the looks of things, so what is it? Well, first of all, I want to give you a little bit of a quick background refresher on exchange architecture so you can understand what proxy token is and, and how it works and why it's slightly worrying for, for most people because it could be the source of, of other issues as well in the future. At least we hope not. Uh, you know, it's not great that exchange has had a bit of a bad year for security. But it's also good that security researchers are finding these and Microsoft are fixing them. Uh, so you've got to you've, you've got to balance it out, haven't you? So I'm going to do a bit of whiteboarding now rather than just show you an old Visio diagram. Uh, and Exchange 2013, 2016, 2019, and Exchange Online do use similar architecture. Uh, and whilst there's only the mailbox role in Exchange 2016, well, there's edge transport as well, but putting that to one side. Um, Exchange 2013 has a client access server role and it has a mailbox role. But 2016 and 2019, they're combining those together in the, the 2019 and 2016 mailbox role. So it still does have that client access service as part of it. So in our in our Exchange server, generally what we've got uh, inside this big green uh, ring of square of um, brilliant functionality... <laughs> Uh, we've got the client access service, CAS, and then we've got the mailbox service here. And if we're running highly available infrastructure, if I zoom out a little bit, then you'll find that this gets replicated several times. Uh, let's use the same colours. So this gets replicated several times over here. Um, let's say we've got three servers, and they'll all be running these same services. You'll see the relevance of this in, in just a moment because not many people are running single server instances. You know, there's a reason why these are split. Uh, so usually you'll have this. And if you're going by the recommendations over the last few years on how to publish exchange, then you might have a load balancer that's sitting here as well. So if you zoom out a little bit, you might have a load balancer. And one of the great things about the way that exchange 2013, 2016, 2019 and Exchange Online are developed is they don't require session affinity. Uh, and this is this is good, but also the source of, of some of these problems as well. Uh, because if we've got a user and our user is accessing Exchange, then they will go in and let's, let's go with a red request. Uh, they'll go in, low balancer will send them to one of our servers and after they have provided their credentials, so let's uh, draw a little key here. After they've provided their credentials, then what the client access front end, as it's sometimes known as, will do is after listening to the request, port 443, HTTPS, after the user then uses perhaps forms-based authentication to authenticate, then it will send that request back to where the actual mailbox lives. So let's say our, our mailbox is here uh, for the user itself then if that's, that's active on a particular mailbox database, then the request is then going to be proxied back to the mailbox server that it's running on. Uh, and that's listening on another HTTPS instance on port 4443. So that means every Exchange server is running 443 and port 80, of course, uh, as its front end, and also 4443, where it's actually doing the real work. So... The mailbox server is roughly equivalent to perhaps a, an Exchange 2010 multi-role server where it's it's rendering 
OWA, Exchange Control Panel. It's doing all the processing to provide responses to MAPI over HTTP, RPC over HTTPS. And it's doing it very, very close to where the mailbox is itself. And the way that this is, is good, the way that it works in a, a way that we often really like um, is because if a second request comes in uh, and that comes to, let's say that, that comes in through the load balancer, maybe the one server's offline or it's just, just an, doesn't have session affinity, if it hits another CAS server, then once that session cookie is provided to say, yes, I've authenticated properly, provided it's secret keys, then it'll go back to where the mailbox is hosted. So if you have went into OWA and you've started to look at your email, you scroll down and then you press new message or press reply, then it's not having to render the whole thing again. It's continuing your request as if it was just another click because actually it's the same back end that's processing that same request. Uh, and that's in general is a pretty good thing. Now it becomes less good when we're thinking about this scenario where there's going to be a problem in terms of like security and authentication and, and all of the stuff that we're talking about right now. Because when you provide your username and password to the front end, well, that doesn't just get reflected to the, the back end in the same way. Um, it's, using, it's, it's using a session token to say that it, it's allowed to, to send that request back. So it's saying, I'm authenticated. I've been given this security token by Exchange by the client access front end. And then when it sends that as part of a post request from the browser, uh, from the client, then it's allowed to go past that authentication layer um, and send that request right back to the back end. And that means that on here, if we look at our simple architecture, so we've got our IIS on port 4483, IIS on port 443, sending a post request and it's sending that token that allows it to proxy hence proxy token so with that token that request is then given a big tick sent back to the back end and the back end some of these services will validate it and say yes or no um, but some services don't need to validate it and one of these are, are certain operations for ECP uh, and instead ECP um, is looking for a canary uh, token for ECP that, that is saying that this request is okay uh, so say we do a request to the back end and we post that all the way back and that is to ECP it's allowed through and the canary isn't correct then it does what seems to be the right thing to start with it sends back a big no it sends that back with a 500 error, uh, but it provides a valid canary that you can then use or an attacker can use on a subsequent request. And when they use that on the subsequent request, then they can make a change. And the change that they might be doing is setting something like, I don't know, uh, the, the, the example from security research is a great one, an inbox rule forward all my mail to somewhere else uh, and they could pick an account to use this against send the mail either outside your organization if you block that uh, or perhaps you haven't exposed exchange to the outside world and they've used a compromised account then to another mailbox in the organization uh, and that's uh, that latter scenario is, is probably one where if somebody is in your organization at the moment, they're using a compromised device um, that even the user doesn't know is, is compromised and is being used to perform actions. Perhaps you haven't got any endpoint detection and response software installed. Maybe you haven't got something like as your Sentinel watching out and you haven't got a SOC service or a SOC, then you, you just might not know that somebody's already in your organization moving around doing what they will. Uh, and this will be the, the next on their list. And the chances are, if they're using a compromised mailbox, forwarding the mail uh, to somewhere else internally or externally, that's going to target 
uh, high value targets like uh, your executives, financial teams, uh, and stuff that they could do with that. And it could be to get into your, uh, some of your online services, banks, things like that, uh, or target those individuals personally, especially if they're, they're using their, their email account for anything like that. So it's, it's kind of worrying because if you haven't patched about uh, for this recently, then you're going to be in trouble. So there's a, a blog article on Practical 365 that I've got together that goes through this quite quickly. So to explain what this is, how this works, especially for an exchange admin, um, and things that you can do, such as running requests against your environment to look for things like accounts with forwarding sets, uh, filtering some of these inbox rules as well, and links to where security experts, which I'm not, where they've created hunting queries for Azure Sentinel, which hopefully you will have. And this is how people are discovering that this is, is already in the wild. And there's a much more detailed explanation of how this works if you really want to read all of the full detail on the Zero Day Initiative, where Simon Zuckerborn has written an in-detail blog post about how this works. Now, if you're looking to patch your servers now, then, you know, it is a bit too late, but there's other things that you should be doing as well. You know, if you're running Exchange Hybrid and you've moved all your mailboxes to the cloud, but you're still running Exchange on-prem, then you'll probably know that you can't remove the last Exchange server yet. However, there's a bunch of things that you can do to try and mitigate against things like this. Uh, and I wrote this before that that most recent disclosure, uh, but this was published on Monday. So a long list of things that you can work through that are going to try and make it easier for you to stop publishing Exchange to the outside world, stop people who shouldn't have access internally to that server. Fundamentally, though, because you're not running mailboxes on this server, then this particular vulnerability isn't going to affect hybrid servers. But there's a bunch of others uh, that are around at the moment. You know, proxy shell being you know yet another one that you should be concerned about. About. So do get patching. It is vitally, vitally important. So get patching and, of course, read Practical 365 for all of the, the best tips and guidance on how to do this. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe and like this video. If you are watching this week, so the last week in August and the beginning of September, then on September the 2nd, I'm talking at Tech, which is effectively our sister conference. And I'm talking about how to remove the last Exchange server after you've moved to the cloud or why you can't just yet. But if you really want to get rid of it, then, then watch because I tell you how. And of course, loads of good reasons for removing it other than just security instance. Thank you for watching and we'll catch you next time, hopefully talking about uh, less depressing news and maybe more Teams Lego figures and stuff like that.